Hey friend, welcome to Java with Julie, hosted by me, Julie Slattery. This podcast is a listener-supported outreach of Authentic Intimacy, a ministry dedicated to helping you make sense of God and sexuality. Well, today I'm returning to a conversation I had several years ago with Lawrence Koo, who will be speaking at next month's Reclaim Conference. Lawrence has been serving with the Navigators for over 20 years. After leading the training and development for young missionaries, he is now the director of iEdge, which is a program that sends out teams of young adults into the nations to do cross-cultural discipleship. Lawrence is an international speaker and consultant on the topic of sexuality and lives in Colorado Springs. And in this conversation, Lawrence shares pretty openly about how he first recognized his curiosity and attraction to men how he found freedom, and what freedom has actually looked like for him. As you know, our upcoming Reclaim Conference is all about surrendered sexuality, and Lawrence can speak on this topic both from his own experience and from the viewpoint of an expert. This is a great episode to start us off, so grab your Java and listen in to my conversation with Lawrence Koo. Lawrence, welcome to Java with Julie. Thank you. Yeah, I've been wanting to have you on this podcast for a while. And for those of you who were at our Reclaim conference, you'll remember Lawrence. Lawrence, you were just an outstanding speaker at the conference. We got more feedback based on what you shared than anybody. I appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah. Your perspective on things is very unique in speaking into just the day and age where we live on these topics of sexuality. So let me just ask you, I know the answer to this because we've gotten to know each other a bit, but share a little bit about how and why you've gotten pulled into the topic of addressing sexuality. Sure. Yeah, I think for me, it comes out of my own journey, walking through a journey of same-sex attractions when I think it started when I was about 10. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have the words for it back then, but I think through my whole teenage years struggling with dad and just also I uh, grew up as a Christian and in that sense the conflict between the spiritual identity that I had and I wanted to have and I thought what it means to follow Jesus but then at the same time a sexuality that then kind of became very clear that that was not according to what I kind of grew up with as this is the correct way or this is the right way to live or even have these feelings. Mm-hmm. So I had to dig deep through the question of sexuality and what is this and what has God meant with that and how has he designed us to be and so that's kind of where I had to address the journey of what is sexuality about. Mm -hmm. So when you say that you look back on your childhood and you experienced same-sex attraction at age 10. I would say yeah I can see it already back then. Uh Yeah. Yeah what does that mean? I mean, it's obvious at one level, but I think sure. at another level, people are like, hey, I knew from the time I was a kid that I was attracted to the same gender. And those who haven't experienced that are like, how can you know when you're that old? I think for me, it was very evident in the sense of that I was drawn to, sorry, as a kid, I was listening to hotlines on the phone with my friends. Mm-hmm. So back then, no internet. And that was a way to kind of access kind of like sexuality that was enticing for us. That was first straight hotlines like women and men. But then I think by myself becoming more curious, I started to listen to gay hotlines. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I'm kind of like, oh, tracing back when I was 10, that was what I was doing. So in that, I don't even know if that was already kind of fully developed as a person or as a, in my sexuality, but that was what I was listening to. So that's what I seen at 10, I was doing that. Okay. And then through teenage years, I think I just looked for that in the sense of, yeah, I was very drawn to gay pornography. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, yeah, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And then I had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you were raised in the Netherlands? Correct. Which, from what I know, is a more progressive country morally, I mean, use that word loosely, than in the United States. In other words, you're about, Netherlands about 15, 20 years ahead of sure. where the U.S. is in yeah. terms of sexual morality. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I, that was the 80s. So that was still, I think the Christian culture was still there. I grew up in that. I think it was in decline already then. Mm-hmm. I was not aware of that. But my parents were solid believers, grew up in a solid Baptist church, which is a very different Baptist kind than I would say here in the U.S. 
And so I would say I just grew up with the same Christian standards and ideas that a lot of Americans would grow up in. Mm -hmm. I think when I became a teenager and later in college life, that was a very dense. I really got exposed to a very post-Christian culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did your parents know about what you were struggling with in your teen years? Yeah, because the hotlines on the phone cost a lot of money. <laughs> So yeah. when I was 12, I think around that age, they were like, what's going on in our house? Why is the phone bill so high? Mm -hmm. And that's when they kind of, when mm -hmm. I got found out and got exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did they respond? Yeah, that was, I mean, so my parents also from an Asian background. My parents are from Indonesia, so they immigrated before I was born. So I think that was a lot to deal with during that time. I just remember my mom pulling me into her bedroom and just saying, and I broke down and crying, actually. And she said, just, what have I done wrong? And my dad couldn't really emotionally engage it. And he said, well, you're not going to do this anymore. And mm -hmm. that was it during that time. Mm -hmm. I think for them, they had to deal with their own kind of just stuff and like the confrontation of it all. And I do think that out of that was, I felt very exposed by that kind of outing in that sense. And I didn't know really what to do with that. And I mm -hmm. experienced just a lot of shame during that time. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. For anybody to experience but i'm thinking yeah. of being 12 13 years old yeah um, not really knowing what was going on mm -hmm. honestly mm -hmm. and just kind of like enticed by something which i didn't have words for mm -hmm. actually yeah. i think during that time either you were raised in a christian home mm -hmm. but as you look back at that age did you have a relationship with god or was it more this is my parents faith no it was a real relationship with god uh -huh. or i would say my mom and dad had a really like a real relationship with jesus i saw it as a child i never doubted the existence of god i never i think doubted that god was loving and i think had a good perspective of who he was mm -hmm. i think what i had to wrestle with in my sexuality was if i was this person in that mm -hmm. sense so i think i was living with a lot of self-rejection and i i did project that towards god as well mm -hmm. like can you really love me if this is really who I am or this is where my sexuality is. Mm. Yeah. What were your teen years like? You had this experience at 12 or 13. Yeah. It wasn't really, it was exposed but not really addressed. So what were you like as a teenager? I would say, and my mom would agree with that, I came from a pretty kind of happy kid and then this started happening and I got really withdrawn and an internal struggle. That's clearly what also my parents saw. I decided to really follow Jesus in the midst of this kind of the beginning of this when I was 12, 13, going to a summer training program as a teenager, really committed myself to Jesus. And I thought, oh, he was solve sexuality then, like mm -hmm. the, my sin issue in that sense. And I mean, I knew I was what I was doing was wrong and there was some sense of guilt and shame about it. And I thought, well, if I follow Jesus, then I will be fine. Mm -hmm. And I think what might happen in my teenage years was this whole spiritual a life with Jesus growing, but at the same time, the sexuality that also just developed towards that I got more words for is like, whoa, I am same sex attracted in that mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. or kind of acknowledging that. I remember still that a friend of mine in school, in high school, she asked me if I was gay, and I was like, I just couldn't admit that mm -hmm. and so i was not ready to come out in that sense mm -hmm. so like no how can you think that of me there was a lot of that going on in my inner life so i think it's a gradual coming to terms even with myself until i was 17 mm -hmm. that i really had to kind of admit to myself yeah this is what's going on what happened when you were 17 a guy came up to me. I was commuting back and forth to school by train. A guy came up to me. I've seen him before. And he kind of like approached me, introduced himself and started chatting and asked me out actually on a date. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what happened. And that's just shocked me because up until that time, everything was just in my mind. It was in my inner secret life. After that exposure with my parents, I never talked about it. And so I was just in shock. So I came home very upset. My mom was kind of like, do you need a counselor? <laughs> and she had someone ready for me because they kind of knew the day is coming that he wants to talk. Yeah, and so the next day I was sitting in my counselor's office just pouring out my heart and mm -hmm. kind of coming out actually to her and then my parents, like who were not there, but of course that was kind of like just sharing my story and my family. And then during that year, a lot of my friends as well. Mm -hmm. And I think what I experienced there, especially with God, was that 
my family didn't reject me, my friends didn't reject me, and God didn't either. Mm-hmm. And I still had that experience even before kind of that moment that crying out to God in the midst of my desperation, like, and asking the why questions all the time, like, why me? Why is this happening to me? That he came always with his presence. Mm. He was always there. And although I think I rejected myself, he never did. I always could experience his embrace. He just really calmed me down through a lot of worship music, honestly, that I could just, like, be at peace with him in the midst of my questions. Mm. So what I learned from that is kind of like, yeah, he didn't give me any answers. He just gave himself. And I think the invitation, especially during that in my year of 17, when all that happened was an invitation, do you trust me mm-hmm. with your life? Mm. Do you want to surrender and give everything to me? Also your sexuality. And I think I was just desperate enough and said, I've done this. I taught to fight this. And here's my life. Yeah. You can have it all. With one condition, I want to experience your freedom because if your truth will set me free, I really want to experience it, especially in the realm of sexuality. Mm -hmm. When you said that, what is freedom? What did freedom mean for you? I think I started with the idea that freedom meant that I was free from my homosexual feelings or same-sex attractions of that. But ultimately, I think what the freedom that I look back now, what God has given me is the freedom to follow him completely even in the midst of my brokenness and broken sexuality. Mm -hmm. And that I have a choice in how I can make decisions out of my spiritual identity instead of out of my sexuality. Mm. You're one of a few people that are outspoken about, I would say, walking a very difficult road. And because on the one side, and there are Christians who say, God accepts me, the people I love accept me, so I am free to walk in gay relationships sure. and, and a gay identity. And there are other people who would say, God accepts you, but he doesn't accept that part of you. And so if you want to follow God, you have to change who you are. Right. You have to change your whole identity. You have to become straight. And God's going to do that miracle in you. Yeah. But neither of those are your reality. I think those are the two extremes that you're describing in that. So there's two kind of opposite sides. Yeah, I think there is, I would say there's a middle way in that. Or not even a middle way. I think there's a higher way, a higher ground. And I think it has to do with the values of that. Of what I see a lot of people saying. I think what my conviction is, is still that I'm embracing my, there's a broken self in myself. Mm-hmm. And although that brokenness is being accepted and loved by God, or in the midst of my brokenness, I'm still accepted and loved by God, I think His grace is also that He wants to bring me further than that. Mm -hmm. I think what I learned from God the Father is that He's not tolerant, or even how He invites back the younger son. It's not about like, well, you know, like, yes, I'll give you all of these beautiful things and you're my son again. But I really bring back an identity of sonship. And I think that's what the Father has done for me as well. And to me, that means I want to live according to the kingdom life. And what does that mean, especially in the realm of sexuality? Mm -hmm. And that has been, for me, the most important kind of like, this is so beautiful. And there's so much freedom in that. And I'm trying to embrace that as much as I can. As you've been interacting just with fellow believers, do you find that there's a pull to one of those extremes or the other? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the biggest conversations that we're having on the realm of homosexuality, LGBTQ questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how does that impact you in your own walk? That's a good question. I think the older I have become, the more confident and more secure I am in, I think, what God is calling us to represent in our sexuality. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if we're straight or gay. From my perspective, then... I have a lot of understanding because I understand why we're here, why those extremes exist. Mm -hmm. I can fight the ideas of it or I kind of disagree with the ideas of that. But I see the stories of the people that have come to that particular conclusion Mm -hmm. and I understand where they're coming from. But even with that understanding, I'm more convicted of where I think that God is calling us as a whole body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this is an LGBTQ question, an issue. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why authentic intimacy exists, why we do this podcast, because it is an issue of the church and the kingdom. And yeah, I think that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
You're right. The same thing plays out in, for example, somebody who's in an unhappy marriage. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a quandary of if God really loved me, he wouldn't want me to have to stay unfulfilled or the other extreme of God, you know, must not love me because my life is miserable and I must have done something wrong and all this guilt and condemnation. And yep. so the same thing plays out no matter what our struggle is. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for you, what has been the linchpin that has helped you? Like you said, the older the you get. The linchpin? Yeah. Do you know that word? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me define it. I don't so know that's where it's my foreignness come out. <laughs> yeah, no. A lot of people probably don't know that one. But I guess... What was it for you that gave you the strong conviction that God doesn't want you to choose one of those extremes or the other, that he's given you the strong conviction that sure. you can remain in the tension of this brokenness yeah. and be a beloved son? I think I started this journey, I think absolutely, I was already convicted that, or I had a sense like, I don't think that God wants me to pursue a homosexual relationship. I think throughout my whole life, I've never had the space to really entertain that as this could be a godly thing. That has always been there. I think I started this journey, I kind of coming out of that, when, even when I was 17, oh, I'm going to counseling with the perception, he's going to heal me, he's going to make me straight. Mm -hmm. This is what freedom looks like. And then walking this journey, especially in my 20s, I came just to the conclusion that I don't think that that was the journey. And it came very evident to me that God was kind of giving me this picture, actually, of... Yeah, there was one time I don't get a lot of pictures. I did have, so I can not say never. But I was in my house with Jesus, and my heart was my house. So that's kind of my life, and that was the picture that I had. I was in my house that represented my heart and my life, and I was sitting there with Jesus at this table. And there was all these broken pieces of life right there at the table. And that was definitely representing my sexuality, especially my homosexuality. And I said to Jesus, like, what are you going to do with this? Mm -hmm. Because what I wanted him to do was take all these pieces, put it in his garbage bag, and put it outside at the trash, out of my heart, out of my life. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. But I kind of knew that he was not doing that. So what are you going to do with this? And he brought all these pieces together. Kind of he made an artwork out of it. He made a painting out of it. And then like he signed it with his name. And then he hung it up at the wall of my house in my heart. Mm. And I just remember that I was just breaking down and crying. It was a very deep, intimate moment. And I'm like, wait, you're going to make something beautiful out of this? Mm. But it's always going to be on display. Mm -hmm. So there's two sides of it, like that it was so profound with like something that I find so shattered, you're going to make something beautiful, but you, oh, we're also going to hang it up. Yeah. This is something that you want me to display mm -hmm. in a particular way. So instead of having two sides that's like, I either can be following Jesus and not have a homosexual kind of like tendency or feelings or whatever, I thought that was the way. But he said, no, we have to integrate both. Mm -hmm. And you can live out of your spiritual identity. You can be my son with a redeemed brokenness. And that's where 2 Corinthians 12, 9 comes in to play for me. That Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. Because my power is made perfect in your weakness. Mm -hmm. And then Paul says, well, that's why I'm boasting my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the journey that I was in. Like, mm -hmm. wait. I don't have to be healed yeah. in that particular sense because I feel like I am healed, but I'm healed in that redemption of like an integrated brokenness. And Parma Parker has actually said that in his book that he says wholeness is actually the integration of brokenness in your life, that it has its place, but it, you know it, you walked around it, you've seen it, and it's not taking you by surprise anymore. Mm. And that's exactly yeah. what ha has happened. I love that picture that God used all the broken pieces to create something beautiful and also that he's asked you to display it for his glory. Yeah. Uh, well, and he did it. it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I didn't want that. <laughs> no, none of us want it, but he's using it. Yes. And he's giving you the strength to do yeah. that. One thing that is unique about a homosexual struggle is to say, if I'm going to walk in that tension, 
if God isn't going to give me heterosexual desire, then that means that I'm going to walk in loneliness. And in our day and age, we make so much out of happiness being found in romantic love and family and marriage and kids that I think most Christians even feel like that would be harsh to say to somebody, well, too bad for you, you don't get all those things. Right. I'm sure that's been just a very real piece of this for you. Yes. I think the perspective of loneliness is a heart-wrenching one. And there's so many aspects, I think, to this. I think there's the reality, objective loneliness in that sense of like, yeah, there is loneliness in this journey. Definitely, I would say also from a single perspective and also a bit from kind of a same-sex attracted perspective, there can also be a lot of victimization. So you put it on yourself even to you withdraw out of it. And I think there's the outward perspective of what other people put on you. Oh, that must be lonely. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, not really. Mm-hmm. But I guess when you're saying that. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a whole different aspects. And I think that it required for some discernment for me. Like, okay, what is real loneliness? How do I experience that? Sometimes it's okay for me to be alone and not feel lonely. You know, a lot of us just enjoy a long time. Yes. (laughs) Is that loneliness? No, that's not. And Mm -hmm. so to have a really good awareness and what do you need then? And then I think the question comes in that for no human, is it okay to be alone? We're not meant to be alone. So what does then community look like? And I think that walking that journey has just challenged so many, I think, questions that how are we doing community as a church, as a Christian community? And I think we can do a lot better in that. Yeah. Especially also for single people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that you made that distinction between being alone and loneliness because there's a woman listening right now who is never alone and surrounded by kids and a husband and people, but always feels lonely. Yes. And just because there are other people in the room and there's noise doesn't mean that there is significant connection. Yeah. I think a lot of people would have said, and still about me in my life, like, oh, but you have so many friends. How can you be lonely? Mm-hmm. But like, I think loneliness is experience, I think, of a lack of intimacy. And you can be in the middle of the crowd, what you're saying, but you can still lack that piece of intimacy. Mm-hmm. When I read the Psalms, uh, David's Psalms in particular, there's such an echo of loneliness there. Yeah. Even though he had many wives, many children, was probably surrounded by people but it seems that he only had a few true companions in his lifetime. Right. And he poured out his loneliness to the Lord and found intimacy with him. There's so much in the scripture, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, about singleness, about service to God, intimacy with God. There's actually very little about marriage. But if you went to an American church, you would think that living the Christian life is all about having happy marriage. Yeah, or it has a fine fulfillment in romantic love or that special someone. Uh-huh. And I think that's one I would say, this is also why one of the reasons I think we're seeing the shift in kind of the theology on LGBTQ in that sense of, well, they have the right to be happy too. And yeah. if we believe that that is then in, in happiness, in marriage and romance, then my gay brother and sister need to have that too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also where that comes from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I know you and I share in common and the way we look at this is, I've said this before on this podcast, but that every sexual question is really asking a deeper spiritual question. Yeah. And these questions about how can you ask somebody who's gay to never get married? How can you ask a single person to not sleep around? Don't they deserve fulfillment and happiness? Yeah. It's really knocking on the door of that deeper spiritual question of, Is that really what brings fulfillment and happiness? Yeah. Is that really what God's created us for? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And it says a lot about the person who asked that question. Yeah. About the questions and the assumption of what fulfillment and happiness looks like. Mm -hmm. But I do think even in the church, then that is very much put on singleness as well. That's not even possible to be happy there in that particular place or find a fulfillment life. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think I had a radical change for myself in thinking through like, but it's not about fulfillment. And you probably have talked about, you talk about this all the time about if it's really, if sexuality and 
in the picture of even husband and wife is to give ourselves fully like Jesus gave himself to the church. Then I think my picture of singleness has become like, and that's maybe the word singleness is not so great either. Singleness. Yeah. No, I think the calling is to give yourself away to a multitude of people in deep intimacy. Mm. Talk about that more deeply, because what you're referring to is what we teach here at Authentic Intimacy, yeah. that our sexuality is about basically pulling us into a relationship that requires self-sacrifice yeah. so that we learn to love as Jesus does. Yeah. And you're saying that not only applies in marriage, but it also applies to the single person. Absolutely. I believe in the two gifts of relationship, the gift of marriage and gift of singleness or celibacy. And the gift of marriage, exactly, if it's reflecting Christ in the church according to Ephesians, the passage in Ephesians 5, then, yeah, husband and wife, in their self-sacrificial love, they're displaying Christ in the church. It's a picture of that. I usually the analogy, it's a trailer. It's a trailer to this beautiful movie of Jesus becoming one with us, the church. And one of the trailers here on earth is the husband and wife. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful trailer, mm -hmm. but if the movie's out, we're not going to watch the trailer anymore. We're going to watch the movie, right? Yeah. But like any other movies, there's several trailers too, to kind of like a appetite to the movie in that sense. And so marriage is one, mm -hmm. but singleness is also one. Mm -hmm. And that trailer is as great and fun and points towards that. And I think, so to me, the gift of singleness or celibacy is not to give yourself fully away and learn how to do that with one particular person. But yeah, the body of Christ itself already. Mm -hmm. And equally important, equally kind of there and, and trying to live that has been such a great blessing to me also yeah. in learning how to do that. Boy, that's such a paradigm shift, Lawrence, because typically we even give language to singleness of saying, well, at least you can travel, at least you can do what you want, at least you like have more discretionary income and time. And at least you can be more selfish. Yes, exactly. That's essentially what we're saying right. is you get to be selfish. That's a good part of singleness. Yeah. And you're saying that's completely unbiblical. Yeah. As is unbiblical that you expect marriage to fulfill you, which is also self-centered in that mm -hmm. sense. I think the, the wrong picture of singleness is like, oh, then you just live your life for yourself. Mm -hmm. But if we take our calling as single people and married people seriously, then it's like, how can I give myself fully? And yes, then for a married person, is that primarily to his spouse and the children. But actually, it goes even beyond that too. Mm -hmm. But for a single person, for sure, it's also the question, how can you give yourself away? And I think sometimes even more imperative for singles, because I think marriage forces you to become less selfish. Yeah. And I think I catched up on that later mm -hmm. because I'm like, oh, I really needed to choose myself to be in community and choose not to have their needs sometimes over mine own. I really needed to learn that because I had that same attitude. At least I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But that changed as well. So how did you learn that practically? <laughs> what What does your life look like giving yourself away? I think my paradigm shift really started with actually visiting my sister and brother-in-law when they were living in Australia. They used to live in Australia. But how I live my life, kind of like even with friendship, a lot of the times in finding intimacy was usually, well, I uh, have my single guy friends, then they start dating. That was already kind of like, okay, that changes the relationship. Then they get married and then, then lose the friendship for a year because then they're so focused on their marriage. And then mm -hmm. uh, usually, on sometimes even on the calendar, it's kind of like, oh, after a year, they come back and they want to <laughs> hang out just one-on-one yeah. -on -one again. I'm like, welcome back. <laughs> but then the kids came. And I didn't know how to relate to that because they really didn't have time anymore. And I'm like, well, you cannot be that friend for me that I need. Mm -hmm. And looking backward, it's the same selfish. Well, it's not even selfishness. It's like self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. Until I came to Australia to visit my sister and brother-in-law, they had that time three kids under four, four, two, and zero. And I was living with them, of course, for those two and three weeks that I was there. And I was like... Oh, so this is what it means to have three kids under four <laughs> and why you are so exhausted mm -hmm. and why you don't have any space and time for other people. And I had so much understanding and compassion 
for my friends because I was seeing what it was. But then I was towards my sister, how can I help? What is my role in that? Mm -hmm. And how can I serve you? And yeah, I didn't like, I mean, I was not the diaper changer and not the cleaner or like bringing the kids to bed, but I love to cook, I love to eat. Mm -hmm. So that, those weeks, the kitchen was my domain. I ruled it mm -hmm. and I was cooking my brother-in-law, his favorite scones and I was doing everything that I could to do that. And the house was a mess, but the kitchen was clean. Mm -hmm. Did all the groceries and stuff. And so that taught me something about this is the posture that I can have. So I came back to the Netherlands and then started talking with my friends. And how, instead of like waiting for them to be involved in my life, which they didn't have space for, which I clearly understood now. But how can I enter into that? And I think for them was the question, do you want me to be there? Can I be involved in this? Mm -hmm. And so I learned, especially with my married friends and family friends, to be around family mm -hmm. and to serve as, like, I'm an uncle, you know, with my nieces and nephew, but even to family friend in that sense. So I, that's one part of in how I learned how to give myself away to my friends who, who are having families. How can I serve? How can I make dinner for them? How I can be part of the dinner table and being interrupted in our adult conversation and learning how to do that as well, not be kind of like irritated by that and just be also with them in parenting, mm -hmm. like with them in that. And it's just been good for me. Have you been the one that had to initiate that? Yes, often I have. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that we really need to learn is how to integrate single and family life because we have separated it. Mm -hmm. And especially when I came to the U.S., that's one of the things that I've saw in American Christian culture. It's even stronger in American Christian culture than where the places I came from mm -hmm. back in Europe. Did you meet resistance? Like if you wanted to be part of family life, did you find that it was difficult to make that happen? I think there's a strong value sometimes like, oh, it needs to be our family time. So mm -hmm. very kind of like it's my family. So the, the nuclear family, the protection of that, I think that's one of them. I think in an American culture also like where is the time for that? Because I'm used to a little bit European lifestyles, like spending a whole evening together mm -hmm. from dinner to coffee afterwards until drinks from like six to ten. Mm -hmm. That's almost not a practice yeah. here yeah it's not <laughs> it's not yeah. so i was used to spend a whole evening with my family with my friends and then their kids uh -huh. they go to bed i'm still there and then we hang out mm -hmm. that's very rare here it's like dinner's over dinner's bye. over bye yeah we have our next thing mm -hmm. or the kids needs to go activities and that kind of stuff and so i had to kind of adjust to that in a sense so it's not a kind of like oh an opposition towards it but there's a loss of how to spend quality time together. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think already in the family unit, is that a challenge? Well, what about then your extended community and family that you want to draw into that? Yeah. One piece of that I'm wondering about is you need female sisters in Christ. Right. And we have a fear of adult male and females interacting. Yes. You know, it's like, what if it becomes romantic or um, yeah. we talk about boundaries and right. protecting. Yes. That must be difficult. And maybe even talk about the need for yes. deep, intimate relationships, not just with males, but with females. Okay. So you address this topic right now because I can talk about that a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> I would say that that is what I've seen also that I spare in the, in the purity narrative mm -hmm. that has not been helpful either. Mm -hmm that I feel like that single are sometimes being perceived to be a threat to the marriage or to the relationship instead of an asset. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it's almost not possible in this thinking that men and women can have just solid, deep, spiritual, intimate brother-sister mm -hmm. relationships without becoming, let it become romantic. Mm -hmm. And I can see that from a teenage perspective or an early 20s perspective when you're in college. Mm -hmm. But if that's still through for me in, you know, the 30s and 40s, that is a very immature posture towards relationships. Mm -hmm. I have a need to have both male friendships and female friendship. And also because of my sexuality, a lot of the times I'm positively discriminated against 
with women because that was never a kind of a threat to them hanging、mm-hmm. out with me. But I see it with my heterosexual, straight, single friends that they sometimes are being excluded from certain relationships just because of they experience that being a threat to the、mm-hmm. relationship. And I think that's not okay.、Mm-hmm. So where do you think you can find that healthy? I don't even want to use the word balance, but dynamic of brother sister relationships、yeah. in Christ that are appropriate yet intimate. Where can you find yeah, it? How, how can you find yeah, it? Yeah, how do we develop those? Well, I would say to engage on healthiness. Sometimes I can make it better. I think in my own examples. So for me, it was with my guy friends.、Mm-hmm. Because for me, the threat was not, or the difficulty was not with intimacy with my female friends, but it、mm-hmm. was especially with my guy friends. And I always thought, well, if it becomes that I feel something more for them, or when it becomes unhealthy, what we teach each other in the Christian world is like, well, then you back off and you just、mm-hmm. like lose the friendship. And I thought, no, I can't do that. And I just realized that sometimes. Like I cross a boundary in my male friendship, sometimes a boundary of that it's actually a really good friendship, but then there's this boundary that's fuzzy with me, where it becomes something more,、mm-hmm. not even like sexual, but just something more of wanting something more out of it.、Mm-hmm. And so the basis of the friendship is great, but then the boundary is just like fuzzy for me. But what we teach ourselves to do is then, like, well, if the boundaries cross, then we lose the whole base and、yeah. we lose the whole friendship.、Mm-hmm. And what I need to learn is like, no, how can I just keep within the boundaries? And then if I go over it, then I just go back a little bit. Yeah. And so I needed to push through with a lot of my guy friends to really become a good friend to them,、mm-hmm. and that we have, and especially with my straight guy friends, that was great to practice,、yeah. and I made a lot of mistakes. Mm-hmm. But they allowed me to do so, and sometimes it came to a point that yeah, we had to then to kind of like I lost the friendship because of my own brokenness in that sense. But after like now, because of all these experiences, I'm a better friend.、Mm-hmm. I matured in how to do this,、mm-hmm. in how to give myself that I can develop friendship that are unconditional,、mm-hmm. in love, and that I try to be yeah you know, serving them ex- exactly with that. Kind of attitude of how can I give myself to you?、Mm-hmm. If I don't had all that messiness to work through, I don't think that I am in this place where I'm at right now. Yeah, and relationships are always messy.、Yeah. It's not just at this level. Yeah, it's how many friendships have we lost because we haven't been able to be honest, exactly, or work through a conflict or stay in attention. Yeah, but a big piece of this, and you said how you've matured. Is maturing to the point where we realize that we're not defined by our feelings; we're defined by what we choose. And so, even with my women friends who knew my story, and we became close, and we do some stuff together, I had sometimes conversations with some of them that they developed feelings for me.、Mm-hmm. But the fact that we could have these conversations、mm-hmm. and said, "I still want to pursue the friendship, but how is it helpful for you, and how the both of us interact?"、Mm-hmm. And so, kind of like we created some boundaries towards ourselves in how we would interact, but also in the maturity, we talked like how should I interpret certain things from you so that I'm not kind of like making decisions for the other person.、Mm-hmm. So one of the things is we with this particular friend, we often went together to the movies and we both initiated towards that.、Mm-hmm. So I really asked her like, so do you want me to initiate still or? You know, and kind of like having the ground rules of that, but the fact that we could have a mature conversation about that was just great.、Mm-hmm. And we worked through that. We're still great friends. She's married now、mm-hmm. with another guy, and it's great. And we worked through it, and we we remained friends. And I think that's possible.、Mm-hmm. Well, clearly, that's yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, how would you define your community today? Well, that dramatically changed three years ago when I moved to the U.S. I had to start all over again. If you talk about loneliness, experiencing that later in life again, that was one piece of it. Trying to be intentional about it, realizing again how much time that cost. I would say I'm in a good place. I'm in a better place. It's growing. I try to live very intentionally now with three other guys. So one of the things that I discovered I should not live by myself anymore.、Mm-hmm. And I think the huge American houses allow us to do so. 
<laughs> yeah. So I have this great opportunity to live in a community of people and also creating space for returning missionaries, which is part of my job to help them through kind of re-engagement process back in the U.S. And that's what I use my house for. Mm. And trying to live more and more, learning what it means to unconditionally love people and especially with roommates, that can be the most challenging. <laughs> but that's good to learn because mm -hmm. that's exactly the marital experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so learning over the last few years even what that looks like and having a lot of hope for that. Um, two houses from us, uh, one of my friends moved in with her son. She lost her husband four years ago when their boy was just two months old. And just trying to also including her. And we even talked about this thing about like, you should come live in our basement, you know, mm. and I shared a house with us. But even that question of like, would that be appropriate mm. for a widow or with her son or to be with four guys? And just having that conversation about like the man, like, is that appropriate? But thinking through a little bit more like, but what is what we need? And then she moved two houses away and we want to be that community for her as well and vice versa. So... How does that look like beyond the what for her and for me both is kind of like beyond kind of like what the nuclear family the perfect picture mm. was i think and yeah how can we be how can we do that intentionally mm. i have a sense that if christians are going to be thriving in today's day and age they're going to have to enter into some of the messiness that you're describing of yeah. building community that doesn't look like the nuclear family um, that looks like reaching out, connecting, loving right. yeah. uh, outside of our normal paradigm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's not only beneficial for single people, but you can speak into that. I think a lot of married people, if they just focus on the friendship between the husband and wife, they need also more friends yeah. outside of that. And that's what I've also seen, that a lot of married people are lonely. They have a great marriage, but lonely outside of that marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of my friends have been talking about, too. And that they also need intimacy with other friends around them, mm -hmm. which enriches the marriage. Well, I think we can realize that freedom sometimes looks differently than we think it should. For Lawrence, freedom has not meant a total freedom from attraction to men, and I don't want that to be a discouragement to any of you. God is using Lawrence and working through him despite the things that he might struggle with. God loves Lawrence despite what he feels, and Lawrence is able to make choices to worship the Lord and love God with his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that should be true of all of us regardless of what our particular struggle is. I am so thankful that Lawrence is going to be joining us for the Reclaim Conference because uh, he is just authentic, sharing from his own journey, and it's going to give you a great opportunity to go deeper into exploring this topic and what it really looks like. Other speakers who will be joining us include Jackie Hill Perry, Brad Rhodes, and Troy and Melissa Haas. We all need to surrender our sexuality, and we all can experience the freedom and the love and joy that Lawrence is speaking about. If you want to join us for our Reclaim Conference, head to AuthenticIntimacy.com slash Reclaim 2024 or click on the link in our show notes. I hope to see you there. Mm -hmm.